Hello, I'm Dennis Buller. One of my favorite parts about being president and CEO of Virtual Health is getting to know our colleagues and the many ways they are here for good. Each person contributes to healthy communities, and each person has a story to tell. Let's meet one. So Bob, of all of the guests that I've had on this show, you're probably the one I'm most familiar with considering we office next to each other. Well, thanks for inviting me. You're, you're, I'm, I'm happy to have you. Listen, you have the unofficial title of being the historian of virtual because you've been around for so long. Tell me a little bit about the difference between the organization today and it was when you started back in the 60s or whenever it was. Sure, sure. <laughs> wasn't that long ago, but it was 1984 is when I started. And uh, we had four hospitals at that point, Camden, Berlin, Moralton, and Voorhees. And when we started, the corporate offices were at Voorhees. But within a few months, we made our corporate office transition to Camden. And our corporate offices stayed there for about 15 years uh, in Camden. So I, I really viewed as Camden being home. About the late 90s, uh, we were West Jersey Health System. Uh, in the north, there was a system called Memorial Health Alliance, which uh, had Mount Holly Hospital. And we needed market share to grow into Burlington County. They were under some financial challenges. So it was a pretty good marriage between both organizations. And that's when we became Virtua. You obviously been a part of or have driven many successful things. What stands out for you? I think the most successful accomplishment, one of them, was the creation of the new Voorhees site on the Greenfield location. Back in 2000, Dennis, we did a 10-year strategic plan. It was an operational plan and it was a financial plan. Now, Dennis, we didn't have a lot of money. Our balance sheet wasn't really strong. <laughs> but nobody did. I mean, no. nobody in healthcare had an awful no. lot of money back then. We were under financial regulation here in the state of New Jersey. So we didn't have a strong balance sheet. I think we had the ability to borrow $90 million, and we had maybe $10 million of cash to build a $550 million facility. But I'll give the board, and especially Bill Bowman, who was the chairman of the board at that time, a lot of credit. They really stretched our imagination beyond what we thought was feasible or capable. And it was a life lesson for me. Uh, never really uh, just settle at a certain point. Try to dream or imagine beyond it. Because I really thought, Dennis, we had no shot. What would you say are some of the secrets to our success as an organization? I know that Many health systems around the country are, are struggling post-pandemic. Uh, virtual, I, I like to think we are a best practice, but what do you attribute our current success to? And I get that question asked when we are out and about because of how we are performing as an organization compared to our peers. And I think the number one thing we do that's better than everybody else is we do meticulous strategic planning and we execute with accountability. And it sounds simplistic that if you just set a strategy and you execute and you're accountable for it, you should succeed. But as you know, many health systems get distracted. They may be stray from their mission or uh, what their business plan is, and they don't really succeed to the extent that we succeed. So do you think that's what helped us to weather these uncertain times because we didn't deviate much pre, during, and post pandemic to our strategy. Right. And, and I think uh, because of the acquisition of Lords, we really had to stick to our strategy because we acquired a financially distressed system and we had an integration plan that we had to execute in order for us to be successful operationally, clinically, as well as financially. And I think we did it flawlessly. I've heard you mention many times the importance of reinvesting in ourselves. So can you explain that a little bit? Well, I, you know, what we do, and I think I give you a lot of credit for this. When you came into the organization, you looked at some of our assets or our business units and determined that those weren't assets or business units that were going to take our strategy and push it forward. 
what we did is we divested those assets, whether they were the fitness centers, uh, whether it was uh, long-term care, and we took the proceeds from that and reinvested it into our future strategic direction, such as the Rowan academic affiliation. You really made us open our eyes to looking at all of our businesses to see how they fit into the strategy going forward, what is their financial performance, and do we need to pivot? It is also about core competency. Mm -hmm. Make sure we, we focus on those things that we do well. I know that you are proud of your collective years, and we have a lot of folks at Virtua that have a tremendous amount of tenure, and I think we have benefited from that as an organization. Can you give some context to, to that for me in terms of not only your tenure, but individuals on your team? So I've been with the organization 39 years. I worked in public accounting. For you, you came with the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much so. But to your point, Dennis, I, there are so many people here in the organization that have such a long tenure. Our board members, for example, Tony Shigonis, uh, Dennis Flanagan, those board members, Bob McElway from a committee standpoint, Stacy Robinson, they've been with the organization 30, 35, 40 plus years. I'm proud of that. And we've kind of grown up together and become a family. So Virtua has benefited from your tenure, from your leadership. But I, I don't know if people know the impact that you've had at the state level and nationally. You've done a lot in terms of working with the New Jersey Hospital Association for many, many years. How does that sort of weigh into what you do? When I was in public accounting as a junior accountant, I audited the New Jersey Hospital Association. So, so you got a chance to audit the places you would eventually work before you start working. For I them. did. Uh, so I really know that organization pretty well. But I was a junior accountant with no experience watching all of these CEOs come in and, you know, as associations sort of guide the health systems in the state of New Jersey. I never thought uh, in my wildest dreams that I would be uh, chairing their investment committee, working on their finance committee, chairing the HBS board, uh, the only CFO that has ever chaired a board at the hospital association. They're typically CEOs. So I've really been proud of my affiliation with the association and with me and John Matzinger on the board, having an opportunity to direct our health systems in a positive way in the state of New Jersey is pretty exciting. Well, clearly you've made an impact. I know this summer you were presented with the Distinguished Service Award from the New Jersey Hospital Association. Was that a surprise to you? Well, I'm sure you had a hand in that as well. <laughs> I usually like to stay in the background. I prefer watching other people get honored and get awards and me kind of stay in the background. But I have to say I, I was humbled by it. I had a chance to bring my family there. Uh, there were literally over 300 people uh, at the event. Uh, it felt pretty special. My last question, you, I know you do a lot of rounds, um, not only in our hospitals, but in our clinic environment. Uh, people see the CFO mm -hmm. coming down the hall. What do people most often want to talk to you about? What types of things are they bringing to your attention? What's the interaction like? It's very interesting. So um, as a CFO, I, we probably have a stigma mm -hmm. to us, rightly or wrongly. When we would have Friday briefings live and we'd be sitting at a table of 30 seats, 27 seats would be full. I would be sitting in the middle. People would sit on the couch before they'd want to <laughs> sit next to me for a Friday briefing. Avoid you like to play. I don't know why. But once they get to know me as a person or other finance people and realize we're just not number people. We're normal, regular people as well. You care about people the other money. things in the organization. Yes. Like you said, about the quality, about, you know, safety. You truly care about the services we deliver. And the questions that I kind of ask are more clinical and operational and indirectly asking, are they getting the proper supplies they need? Are they getting the proper equipment? What could we do differently from a facility standpoint? And then not really knowing what my full job responsibilities are. I just take that information, we take it back, and we try to make adjustments if we can. By taking in that information, to your point, it allows you and your team to do a better job 
Absolutely. of supporting our frontline folks. Absolutely. Which makes a great difference. And we get great enjoyment out of doing that. Well, Bob, it's really been a pleasure to have you on Here for Good, the Inside Edition. It's always great for me to be able to talk to one of my colleagues. Again, another exciting episode of Here for Good. Tune in as we continue to explore the many facets of virtual health.